um, Little Torrington, all the way through to Shebbia. Good morning, uh, my name is Pete Christie, I represent Biddeford North. Uh, Ruth Craigie, I represent East of Biddeford. I'm Rose Millard, I represent Three Walls and Two Rivers. My name is Pete, I'm Pete Watson, and my ward is Brody. I'm Ray I'm Helen Smith. Good morning, Sean Langton, Development Manager. Good morning, Chris Levin, I'm Northern. Stacey Dory, Senior Solicitor. Yeah. And we've got Sam, Sandra, Sandra and you. Kirsty. Kirsty. Taking the minutes this morning. We've got Matt, volunteer as well, highways. The next thing I've got to say is the fire drill. The pit lane, as, as, as a feature, as a forum, will be retained within the development. It will, however, be closed to vehicle traffic for part of it and will become a green lane, so um, available for pedestrians and cyclists. But it will stay in that same form. If it was to be upgraded for vehicle traffic, then the character would change significantly and would also be biodiversity issues. So, just to clarify that, so the members are clear. I just hold up the indicative letter, which members will have seen on the last presentation. So today, and that is just the main access of the Buddha Road, which is here. There are other points of access to serve the pump in the station, and also the point of connection with Pit Lane, Pit Hill, as it becomes. Um, however, those points of access will be considered reset matters, so it is before you for determination. It was just primary access. Um, the, the application proposes up to 110 dwellings. Um, they're indicatively shown in a broad mix that, that's in line with the housing and economic needs assessment. So that mix of one, two, three, and four beds is broadly in line with what our housing need evidence is, is showing. It's a density of 29.5 dwellings per hectare across the site which is an appropriate um, level of density for this type of site and bearing in mind it's an allocation. Um, in terms of open space, the section 106 would secure 0.807 hectares of open space, which is policy compliant. Um, and the only other thing to mention would be as foul drainage. Um, there is a need for a pumping station um, to because it's, the, it's not possible to have a connection without gravity up to the notes when yesterday because um, three minutes is not very long and uh, I don't want to talk too fast so that you can't absorb it. So I'm I did send, there, don't in the past now, yeah. So um, I did send um, it to you all yesterday so you've got it to maybe refer to if necessary. Um, <coughs> this is all very emotional for us and I thought because uh, it's such a way Oh sorry, do I need to um, it's all very emotional for us and I thought this is it's, um, um, a huge thing for um, a lot of us. But um, anyway, I will start. Um, in the de development viability review and the latest committee report, there are numerous references to the fact that the land that was a road pit is not viable for development. Um, viability appraisals offer informed assessments of how much affordable housing can be viably provided by calculating presumed costs and values. Obviously, the actual costs and values can only be known after the scheme is built. Therefore, the viability reports are a snapshot in time, including various assumptions and contingencies, and the ones provided are all based on an outline planning application. I would have expected to see a reference to overage in the report, but this has not been brought up at all. It's clear from the planning officer's report that TDC are compromising on the section 106 contributions and the visible number of affordable homes. Section 106 is a mechanism which makes a development proposal acceptable in planning terms. Um, that would not otherwise be acceptable. There was a court case in 2018, Parkhurst, uh, Parkhurst Road Limited versus Secretary of State for Communities. The application comprised 112 homes, of which 16, 
16 were affordable. Islington to refuse permission. A decision was upheld on appeal, partly for not providing enough affordable housing where there was a significant, significant unmet housing need. The strategic housing market assessment update identified the significant scale of affordable housing need as 58% at the college. In the local plan under section 7, under 7.21, it states, open market housing is out of reach to many that due, sorry, lost my line, can you hold the clock a moment? <laughs> due to a significant imbalance between wages and house prices, with evidence showing that residents of some of the lowest earnings in the UK in this area. There is a clear government policy in the National Planning Policy Framework and the local plan in regard to affordable housing on development sites. But if exceptional circumstances are found, affordable housing is always the one that suffers. It's clear from the viability report and review that the figures show that the developer cannot afford to build affordable units, even though they are offering two times two bed units and three times three bed units. At what cost to the development as a whole do we know? With the challenges of the site, including drainage and impermeable rock in one area, favour estates cannot afford to develop this site at a loss. Can I ask you to find it? Yes. In the local plan, a balanced local housing market is mentioned. Once again, the TDC Plans Committee are letting down people who live in this area and are offering even more second homes to people outside the area who can afford to own and run two or more residences. 50% of Appledore comprises second homes and or holiday lets. This development is going to increase this percentage and will add very little to the local economy, but will add to the infrastructure issues, traffic, pollution, and parking. Thank you, Sarah. That's Last one sentence. It's interesting that the climate emergency meeting is being held this morning. Thank you very much. promises an Appenor fire station has been kept open. The only reason there is a fire station in a small village like Appledore is because of the shipyard. How is this relevant to this development proposal at Mid Hill? Some members will recall the huge controversy over the Nat House proposal, not the last one for about 50 temporary shabbies, but the previous ones which sought to build hundreds of houses. This was rejected at a full planning inquiry, mainly on the basis that there will be inevitably be complaints from new homeowners at NAP regarding noise from the shipyard, which would force it to close down. This Pit Hill proposal is much nearer to the shipyard. So what do we want to see? We want to see vital skilled jobs return to our area or a new housing complex all out of proportion to the capacity of the local infrastructure to support it. Roads, schools, health service, provision, sewerage treatment, etc. And we shall provide little or no low-cost housing for local people. <coughs> Further, time and time again, the Development Viability Review questions the whole viability of the application. Indeed, it only makes financial sense if the developer makes little or no contribution at all to Section 106 contributions such as education, drainage, health, etc. This is truly astounding. Planning department seems to have been bending over backwards to accommodate the developer's interests and to achieve a successful outcome while ignoring the justified views and interests of the residents' associations and all of town council and any financial contributions the developer should be paying towards local infrastructure. TDC has already complied with the government's housing demands. We do not want another dense housing estate of 110, 250, 300,000 pound homes, all out of proportion to the size of, the, of our historic village. What we do want is skilled jobs and low cost affordable housing. This proposal threatens the, uh, the return of the former and marks and makes no provision at all for the latter. Thank you.
Um, <coughs> uh, my name is Ian Baker, I'm the Managing Director of Baker Estates. Before you today is an application for the outline approval of a scheme that is allocated for residential development in the newly adopted local plan. It is an application that is a strong and robust recommendation for approval from your planning officers. An application that has had not one objection from statutory consultees on any technical matter, from highways, environmental, noise or drainage, assessed on noise on all grounds, uh, including the shipyard. A scheme that has been independently assessed for viability not once, but twice by professionals who have determined that the level of affordable housing offer is entirely appropriate. All aspects of these independent reviews are being completely transparent and made available to the general public for review. Such disclosure and openness from a developer is extremely rare. We have absolutely nothing to hide. If you do not approve an application with an officer's recommendation for approval on an allocated site with no objections from consultees that provides appropriate levels of affordable housing and Section 106 contributions, then I would ask what applications will be approved. The scheme provides Section 106 contributions in excess of £500,000 for primary education, highway improvements in ecology, as well as two acres of public open space. We are enshrined within our application a design and access statement which details the quality that can be expected. Baker Estates are an award-winning developer. The design and access statement will be reinforced by the production of a full design code as part of, the, of a subsequent reserve master application to lock in the quality of design that is required. Councillors can be sure that they are going to get a quality development. To say that the scheme will be the death battle wall, as the wall member declared in November, is looking through the wrong end of the telescope. It's the exact opposite. Communities need new entrants to survive and thrive. The scheme will generate economic stimulus for the area and it is also a fallacy to say that these homes will only be for outsiders and oil makers. Our experience, our business, uh, it says overwhelmingly these homes will be bought by local people. We all know it's cheaper to buy than it is to rent. Um, and if if, and we're all hoping it would, if the shipyard um, reopens, these skilled workers are going to need somewhere to live. They're going to need house to buy where better than somewhere close to their source of employment. The development will have a high proportion of two and three bedroom homes, as well as bungalows, and that's not something you hear very often, and will be affordable to local working people. Baker Estates would be economically incompetent if they were not. So I would urge you to support this application and allow Baker Estates to get on with delivering much needed homes and contributing to the community capital. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Right, we, we've now got two more members to speak. First of all, Councillor Ford. Councillor Hames, I stand. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning. Here we go again. <laughs> At the last meeting when this application was considered and after I commented a number, on a number of aspects, you were advised by the chairman that only the question of access should be considered and that the other matters I raised would be considered at detailed stage. I subsequently queried this advice of the case officer and circulated her reply to all of you. And to quote her, she said, my committee report sets out all the material planning considerations of the relevance of the application. <clears throat> so it was very appropriate for comments to be made on any of these areas. The scope for refusal reasons does go beyond just access and could concern anything that would make the principle of development unacceptable. Given this advice from the planning officer, I'd like just to briefly refer again to the material matters I raised last time. The first issue was the lack of a master plan in the application, showing comprehensive development for the whole site and not just part of it. The requirement which is laid down in the supporting text under policy NOR 7. I refer also to the report of the landscape consultant commissioned by our council. In this report, the consultant points out that the most sensitive parts of the allocation are the highest slopes, or the higher slopes, which will be best kept clear of development and use green infrastructure and biodiversity. Given this, he concludes by saying, 
It is recommended to the to meet the landscape elements of policy NOR07. The applicants and landowners are encouraged to consider the allocation holistically rather than as a series of unconnected individual developments. <coughs> In other words, a comprehensive approach is needed. However, as the application you are considering relates to the less prominent part of the allocated site and only proposes construction of part of the housing allocation, this gives a future developer about 25 houses to fill the remaining prominent part, which opens the possibility of a very dense development on the visually sensitive skyline with little room for the required green infrastructure and biodiversity gain. Such a development would fail to comply with the requirements of policy NOR7 to minimise any loss of landscape character and also policy STO4 regarding quality of development and DMO4 regarding design principles. Furthermore, as the landscape consultant reports, there will be an adverse visual impact on the setting and significance of the listed Tapley Park and the conservation area of Westley, and there will also be a harmful visual impact on the character of Appledore. Referring to the southern part of the site, uh, adjoining Woodard Road, I suggested there will be a severe impact on the landscape given the inadequate provision of woodland at this point. And this was highlighted by, by other objectors and also the council's landscape consultant who recommended planting a broadband woodland at this point. Regarding the highways, highways impact, I ask you to consider the likely effect on pit of traffic from the proposed development. The road is an attractive country lane which is narrow and one way in places, but which in my experience is used regularly as a rat run between Wood, Woodall Road and Appledore. It lacks pavements for most of its stretch, but is used by pedestrians, including school children going to Appledore School. The likely danger to pedestrians from additional traffic generated by the development, at nearly one car per minute, as I understand it, is, I submit, contrary to local plan policies, SD10 and DMO5. I also disputed the County Highways Declaration as a right-hand turn provision from Churchill Way is not necessary, and pointed out that the use of Woodall Road by heavy lorries and the blind spot at the top of the hill, approaching the turning from the northern direction, make that junction particularly hazardous. I also suggested the traffic generated <coughs> by the new housing would have an adverse cumulative impact on the local road network. As for the provision of access to the adjacent future development site required by policy NOR7, the lack of a comprehensive master plan means this isn't shown. Regarding biodiversity, I noted the record of 11 species of bats on the site, the foraging opportunities for badgers and owls, and the wide variety of bird life recorded. Given this, I suggested the effect of housing density and associated light pollution, disturbance by humans and domestic animals, loss of hedgerows, and reduction of habitat for overwintering birds, has not been fully compensated for by the insufficient infrastructure on the application site. Although the applicants have arranged an offset site at Kenwood Valley, it appears from the report that this will consist of newly planted woodland, a habitat for which, while very important, would fail to provide for a whole range of wildlife found on the grassland and in the hedges at Pit Lane at the site, which would take many years to establish. May I repeat concerns raised just now to about Papagall Shipyard? Complaints from householders of new development about noise from the yard could seriously jeopardise its future and therefore impact a vital source of local employment. Finally, I refer to affordable housing, which is a requirement for the site under the policy NOR7 and the local plan. The independent report on the viability of the development commission, which was commissioned after the first consideration at committee in November, confirms that development would be viable if any more affordable housing was supplied. However, having previously stated that notwithstanding the viability issue, they were willing to supply 5% affordable, but on seemingly on the basis that there will be no Section 106 contribution to education and recreation in the community, the applicants now appear to be indicating they can't build any affordable housing or fulfill all of the 106 contributions. Of course, they say have cost increases to do with developing the site. While I recognise the pressure on this authority to fulfil the local housing allocation, the proposal before you is totally unacceptable and reflects an all too familiar story 
of a developer negotiating down from the 30% required in the local plan. And specifically, one questions why the site was allocated in the plan, apparently without a proper assessment of the cost of developing it. Indeed, this application highlights the urgent need for this council to amend the local plan and to investigate a radical new housing strategy, including direct social provision and a new system to appraise viability and to strengthen affordable housing requirements. And um, another speaker has mentioned the overage and that matter of um, benefiting from a largely expected profits from the development. And there are other measures which will be introduced. The possibility of no affordable housing on the site means that local people will get no benefit from a housing estate that many of them don't want and containing houses which most won't be able to afford. I should also query why the developer and your officer put the priority on so-called quality housing above the need for affordable dwellings. May I ask why good design and quality shouldn't be compatible with affordable housing? Mm. Is our council saying that people with lower than average income should be content with poorly designed and built housing? Mm -hmm. At this point, the recent high praised social housing in Norwich comes to mind. The fact that currently Torridge is, significant, is significantly under its target to provide the required 171 affordable homes per year is another reason for rejecting this development, as is the local housing needs demand. The applicant should come back with a development which complies with the 30% affordable requirement should, but shown in the context of a comprehensive master plan so that, the pro so that the proposal could be properly considered. In this connection, paragraph 7.32 on page 75 of the local plan is highly relevant. It, state that, it states that where a proposed site is subject to phasing is subdivided or therefore where there is a reasonable prospect of adjoining land coming forward for residential development, the local planning authority may consider the site taken as a whole for the purpose of determining the appropriate affordable housing provision. I also submit that I've got other strong reasons to reject this application on grounds of failing to minimise impact on the character of the landscape insufficient green infrastructure and biodiversity gain, too great a density of housing, not fulfilling access requirements, failing to deal with traffic impacts on local highways, and impacting adversely on local infrastructure and services. Thank you.
could be met with either no fossil wind in, so people that's already in the area could stay here, man our lifeboats, man our fire service, that would be great. As I mentioned at the last meeting, never had that before, I shout out and broke people, like me, who might want to stay there, quite bad at place. No consideration at all. If you had a bit of a mix here, and then had 56 iron properties, which one, the South Highway, one of those, will keep the fire station going from five to eight years. One is in Earth Street on the secret side. The sale will keep the fire service. We've totally lost the plot, I think, to human rights. But basically, I'm simply saying to the committee here, it is a difficult show, and you will get changed, and at least I want any fraction to your day as such, which we did at the last one. If the central government want to drive and almost use direct on our officers, I want no part of it. I mean, I'm a conscious client, I'm going to wash my hands of that, because that's not the way to operate. And it isn't a shame that very often, these days, we judge our well-being on how much our houses is worth, and not the future of our children. Because in the minute, never mind global warming, actually, we're doing a damn good job to ruin the settlements we're already living in. With our people. Never reach 30%, and you do wonder why do we have it our local plan? We never get to have it. Um, so now, there's a few points I want to make. The first one is it, one of the letters I received last night um, by email. Uh, really interesting, it did strike me I wonder why we had thought this before. That one of the reasons why the viability is being questioned and said, so, you know, it's, we can't build anything else because it's so expensive to develop. It's because one of the fields here is underlying by impermanent rock. It's very boggy and therefore needs some quite expensive planning works. Um, apparently, the letter writer wrote to our planning officer who said, yes, there was a test carried out. But you think, well, surely this is going to affect the viability of lots of sites that have got outlying plans, which are lots of houses. But when they come to full application, I'm sure this is going to be argued because they've done the tight, they've done the test, and it'll be shown that all oh, it's very difficult to do. And I wonder if we haven't shot ourselves in the foot by allocating sites, but we haven't really carried out the field work to see if they are developable and meet our targets. That's only a point. It's an interesting point, I thought, in the letter. It's not something I had thought of before. <coughs> now, when I asked for this independent biodiversity study, um, it was about affordable housing. And I, I was actually making a rod from my own back because I hadn't realised how technical all this was. I spent the weekend immersing myself in benchmark land values, gross, oh God, it goes on. But it's really interesting because if you look at our report, if you can turn there, just follow this. If you turn to page 33 in our report, Paragraph 625. BB, there the firm did So, I've not included the land value in the assessment due to the stated lack of financial viability. And yet, if you turn on uh, to page 37, this is their report. Um, the third box down, as it were, development costs, acquisition costs, benchmark land value, 925,000. Now, the Council of Ford referred to this. Do we actually have the price that was paid for this land? Do we know that?
doesn't have an exact figure, but what has been applied in the appraisal is That's appropriate. Right. So your very first sentence, you said this is an assumption. Mm -hmm. It is an assumption. Right. This is what I find bizarre, is the whole viability study is based on assumption. Uh, but it's still there. Yeah. Now, if the developer paid less than this assumption, then we're not getting affordable houses. Either. If he paid too much, we're not getting affordable houses. And it seems bizarre. And I was intrigued because this has been going on in London. And uh, this is a report put out by um, a firm of solicitors, actually, who've been working for the Mayor of London. Uh, I'll just read it. The Mayor is fed up with developers arguing that it's not viable more for them to deliver policy compliant levels of affordable housing due to the high prices they are paying for sites. He's issued a supplementary planning guidance on this. Uh, he refers to the circularity it's causing. Land prices are higher than they should be because buyers and sellers are not factoring in de delivering much affordable housing. Now, I don't know if this happens. That's what I don't know. But we do seem to be basing all our viability studies of this on an assumption. And I find that quite bizarre. And here we are, we've got 30% as our target in our local plan. And yet, as I said, all the developers are coming in and arguing that down on the basis of these costs. And yet, when you go to the value and say, can you carry out this report? The value is working on an assumption. And it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, the other point, I, I've heard, I heard it the first thing, I've heard it again. There's going to be an offset for uh, biodiversity, and I've got some new woodland in the Kenworth Valley. Now, Councillor McLaughlin and myself, we represent the Kenworth Valley, or most of it. Nobody's ever approached us and tell us where this is. The only woodland planting I know of, scheduled in the Kenworth Valley, is on the land next to the Kingsley School. And as chairman of the British Trust, I own that. <laughs> we are paid for the tree planting there. I don't want any developer coming and saying, oh, that do. Where is this going? Nobody's told us. And yet I find, I didn't ask last time, nobody's got back to me. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, you did, Councillor Christine. Um, as explained in the report, and I believe as I responded at the 7th of November, we have been provided with an indication of where this biodiversity diversity of setting would go. Um, it is tied in with the bias moved up biosphere as well. Um, however there are there is confidentiality with those particular sites so I'm not able to confirm where they are and did we have been able to upload that information as publicly available. I'm afraid that that's the that's the position. So can I just come back on that because given this is a very sensitive site and we're going to do some offsetting how definite is um, is that plant? Because you know, confidentiality might turn out to be on, can't do it. So the it's a financial sum that's being provided by the developer. They're not actually doing the planting, and that will be secured through the section 106 as per what's set out in your report. Um, it would then be through the North Devon Biosphere and whoever through them that would then use that money and will be clear clause within the 106 to ensure that that money is fully spent on what it's meant to be spent on. So who would spend it? It would, so it would come to the District Council. Again, we haven't worked on any legal agreement yet. I imagine it would come to the District Council and then it would go through the North Devon Biosphere, as I understand it, but the detail of that and the mechanisms for that being justified and that those monies being directed to an appropriate Type of biodiversity would come out through the agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to uh, pick up on one of Councillor points about the uh, Kenwood Valley. Now, uh, Helen, you mentioned about the wasn't the public use for the information. But what about council information? We're a bit more members, and obviously it does affect us. The nice and old actually going on the wall, so we actually go back to the residents who live in there. You get touched touch it was not for public forum, but you know, we're not public, we're part of youth council. That's your work, first one, please. Um, I think that I understood what Helen said. That if it's about £35,000 I think we're talking about in this biodiversity offset, nobody's mentioned yet that it's the Kenneth Valley officially. I don't know, but I think if I'm right in what I heard, various sites are still being considered. 
And when the site is chosen, the money will go to the North Devon Biosphere Reserve. They'll spend that money on the site that's been chosen. So there's no, as far as I understood, it, definite site, yeah. I can, I can come back on that. Um, yes, Councillor McGough. So possible Ooh. sites within the Kenworth Valley have been provided. I mean, we, as a council, are keen to secure that 10% net gain that's required, and that can be through off-site contributions. But <coughs> there needs to be at least some certainty that that money can be spent somewhere. Um, the, the sensitivity behind it is, as I understand it, it was the landowners request that the information, those particular plans, weren't made publicly available at this stage. As Councillor Leather advised, it is at this point securing a contribution that will then go to, for that purpose. I would hope that at such a time, if consent is granted, and at such a time as that money is looking to be spent, we can ensure that there's adequate clauses within the Section 106 that, that, that mean, means it's looked at properly, that the relevant ward members could then be involved at that stage to look at these sites and, and the benefits that could come forward. And if it, what, what the appropriate form of net gain in a particular location would be. Yes. Yeah, just to touch back on that, it, it, it does cover the Northern Devon biosphere. And you say money's going to go to the Northern Devon biosphere. Does that potentially mean it may not even come to us as storage? I'm not trying to be pedantic, but I'm just, you know, it's a big thing for us for climate change, climate diversity, you know, we need to screw some of the area, don't we? So. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it's not that. So that will come down to the wording of the legal agreement. Um, it needs to be geographically local within reason to the application site. So um, and I, I can only imagine all the clauses within any legal agreement that would secure that and it's looking at whether it's a range, but the community and biosphere would then well have us on suspense that um, you know, if we get to the point where I think the agreement could be worked out, then we can of course share that that particular clause with you it's an area of concern for it. Councillor Christie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just going to follow up on Councillor Brown, actually, about that school, because we know that one of the things that upsets people enormously, and I can't answer, when we talk about all these new estates coming, people ask, where are the health centres going to be? It's already overcrowded, schools are already overcrowded. But this one, when we um, passed 550 houses at Winston, that's between the Link Road and the Atlantic Village, <coughs> It was specified there they couldn't build any houses until they built the school because the pressure on schools in Biddeford was so intense. That hill, I've seen absolutely no work go up there since it's been passed. And if this one goes ahead, there's a lot of new houses coming. Do we have any um, point on the Dan Hill school that Dan Hill can't build it and this, these houses can't be built until there's a school at Dan Hill? Because last Thursday I was at a dinner as the mayor and I was actually sitting next door to the ex-head of Apple Law School. Uh, and I talked to her about the crowd because two of my grandchildren went to Apple Law School, so I'm well aware of it. And it does strike you that you mentioned the chicken and egg chip, but should we be addressing this now? Because if this is like it's built, if Dan Hill gets built, and the school comes along later, then we are going to be in really serious trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very rapid point, Councillor Christie. Um, the the Devon Hill outline application was for uh, 550 houses, including provision for a primary school. The legal agreement that was signed in association with that commission requires a service school site to come forward in the first phase of the Devon Hill development. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen in, in the media that Linden Homes have now required the land for that first phase and they are looking <coughs> forward with an application imminently. Um, we can't disclose the nature of any pre-application discussions, but um, I think there's there's confidence that that school will come forward um, sooner rather than later. And then you have that balance, I mean there needs to be money to then facilitate the building of that school and that would come from the development. I think it's it's risky then preventing any houses being built on other sites because the, the trigger points for the contributions wouldn't come through, so it has to be managed very carefully. That I can provide members with the comfort that 
we are expecting an application soon to come in on that first phase, which would include the service school site. We right. would see them be over to Devon County Council to provide yeah. this. Should this development then be locked into the development of that school, in the same way that Dan Hill will be locked into it, this one we're told that children from this estate will be going to Dan Hill's school. Should these two estates be locked in together? So the issue of pupil numbers um, becomes quite complicated. So at the moment, at Appledore Primary School, there's a number of children from the northern catchment. So the, the numbers that have been generated, there's never been pushed back. So those children would then go to the new school. So there is a pressing need for that new school. In terms of what's generated for Appledore itself, yes, there is going to be an increase, but this development, children on this development would assume be within that Appledore catchment and we go to that Appledore school. Good quality development. I, it's something over the years that's really concerned me that some of these, I, I won't put them in, in the air, but they're awesome. You can only get a cigarette paper between the primary houses and the roads are narrow, there's no green spaces, there's two acres involved here. And the separate site that, that comes forward is a bigger green area to be, to be uh, included in the next site. So, I'm going to move that this, this is approved in our mind because, and I, I am sympathetic with a lot of what I've heard this morning, but we really do need to grant this outline application, I feel, and I'm going to move that we approve the outline application. Somebody like to say that? I'll second it. Councillor Watkins. All right. And I have a move on that, and it's moved for approval then, the outline application. All of the favour. Right, Councillor Wiseman in favour, Councillor Craigie in favour, Councillor Locke in favour, Councillor Watson in favour, Councillor Leather in favour. Those against? Councillor Brown, Councillor Christie, Councillor Gordon, and Councillor McDonald. So that, that is kind of Thank you. And, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, I won't be disappointed, but it, 